Hi everybody and welcome to the last lecture on video coding, this time about stereo video coding. So a further application of the tools we saw, particularly the motion compensation and prediction, is stereo video coding. Stereo video is used for creating a spatial impression where each eye sees its own picture or video and where the pictures between the eyes have slight disparities between them which contain the depth information. The closer an object is to the eye, the more disparity we have between the pictures for each eye. The brain uses this disparity to estimate the depth of an object. The simplest approach would be to have two separate video streams, one for each eye, with the problem that we obtain twice the data rate when we transmit them. This problem of increased data rate becomes even worse if we have more than two views, also called multi-view video. Right, so this is also an application, for instance, for auto-stereoscopic displays. Right, so, um, where, we been, where we can see 3D video without glasses. These displays protrude, uh, produce different views to different angles from the display such that each eye sees a different view and such that if the head is moved, slightly different views are seen, which increases the 3D effect. The number of views usually is up to about a dozen. Another common approach for stereo displays is to use shutter glasses. They use the fact that modern monitors or displays can display 100 pictures per second or more, such that we can display one image for the left eye, followed by an image for the right eye, separated by the shutter glasses, which opens each glass only when the image for the corresponding eye is displayed. But this again needs only two views. <coughs> um, actually, a common alternative is also to use polarized glasses. So instead of shutters, you have um, polarized glasses, like right polarized for one eye, left polarized um, for the left eye, or for the other eye, and then uh, the different rows on the display have the corresponding polarization, so such that one eye sees the even rows and the other eye sees the odd rows. This is also quite common. Um, so in this way, you would need um, more more rows um, for display. The multi-view ap approach would then even increase the problem with the bitrate by multiplying the bitrate needed for a single video stream by the number of streams, if we don't in take into account the redundancies between them. An interesting approach to reduce the bitrate can be seen in auto-stereoscopic displays, where there are approaches to generate multiple views from just a pair of views such that we have reduced multi-view video to stereo video. Right. So input is stereo, output is multi-view. This is also an important approach because often only two views are available as a video source. Our goal is now to use the redundancies between the stereo and multi-view videos to reduce the bitrate or to generate new views. The problem which becomes especially apparent when looking at auto-stereoscopic displays is that the new views that we generate might not have sufficient quality. Often visually important information cannot be interpolated, for instance, if new angles with new patterns appear in the new image. So when you have in-between views between left and right, for instance, most of the time you can use interpolation, but if some new pattern appears behind an object, um, then uh, this cannot be done. The solution of this problem would be important because, for instance, the auto-stereoscopic display development would then be independent of the transmission of multi-view video. It could all be based, for instance, on stereo video content. Even stereo video content contains a lot of redundancies between the two views, which could be used to reduce the necessary data rate for the transmission. The approach that is taken is to use motion estimation and compensation, not only in the temporal direction, 
but also between the left and the right stereo video or behind the or between the multiple video uh, view video streams so basically we take the same approach as before for motion compensation where we also have the effect that, it, uh, that an object is moving over time what's only different here is that an object might be moving when we go from the left eye to the right eye or vice versa uh, from the disparity but basically if the effect is the same so we could apply the same tools so this principle can be seen in this following image so here we have now the right channel for the right eye and a video sequence and here we have the left channel which in this case is also the base layer for the left eye and we can see here that we have um, we can apply our usual motion compensation in this direction in the temporal direction but we can also apply disparity um, compensation from the left to the right eye so if we have some information transmitted on the left channel and it's the same on the right channel we can just transmit a disparity vector which tells us which part of the left channel corresponds now to the desired block on the right channel so for each block on the right channel we look for which block on the left channel is more similar and use that as prediction and um, yeah and this way basically we have two ways uh, for prediction we can predict from left to right or we can predict from the past to the present and we can also um, combine the two we can decide which works best or we can combine them so this picture is from this paper here this article joint prediction algorithm and architecture for stereo video hybrid coding systems from Li Fi Ding, Xiao Yi Cheng and Liang Ji Chen in the IEEE transactions on circuits and systems for video technology in November of 2006. Applying the principle of motion compensation to the disparity between views is now called disparity compensation. This is a principle which was also defined with an MPEG for multi-view video sequences. A possible coder structure using this principle can be seen in the following image. Here you can see the block diagram. So on the top we start with a base layer. So we can see we have the left frame coming here in on the top left side. Then we have a base layer coding. So this is our usual coder, for instance H.265. And then we have the compressed data left. So this is our video stream. At the same time we have the right frame coming down in here. right? And so the right frame now um, uh, can be predicted also from the left frame. So here we can see it. So the left frame first has a motion vector here. Motion vector, it goes into this prediction stage and it also has a, a disparity. Here you can see motion and disparity vector. So here we have uh, the disparity estimation here. Right? So this takes uh, the input from the left channel here and the input from the right channel coming up here through the mode decision. So this decides if you want to have motion or disparity estimation and then here it computes the disparity estimation and, um, and then it's doing the motion and disparity compensation here. So basically it's uh, uh, predicting and um, computing the difference. So now we have a motion and disparity vector and this gives us two vectors. So the motion vector is seen here. This is the motion vector from the left channel, compressed and transmitted. And then there's also this disparity vector, which is um, compressed and transmitted over this bitstream here. And 
what you can see down here is the usual decoder and the encoder such that we can make sure that the um, frame buffer in the decoder contains the same image as in the encoder regardless of quantization which we can see here so this dct and quantization here is inverse quantization inverse dct and here adding up and we get this frame memory so this would be the same as in the decoder and after compensation and quantization we have the compressed write data which now hopefully is much less than the left so the main data load now should come from the left frame the video from the left which is the base layer and then the right uh, video is basically um, an enhancement layer it's based on the data from the left channel and so hopefully this would have much reduced data rate yeah so this is the principle of joint motion and disparity compensation um, illustrated in this image and this is um, from joint prediction algorithm and architecture for stereo video hybrid coding systems again from this paper yeah, and here, as I just mentioned, M and N are the motion and disparity vectors. So here you can also see how it works. So here we have the left and the right channel. Here's the frame sequence. And you can see here's an example where we have a motion vector, motion estimation and compensation. So we have a current frame down here this is the latest frame time goes down so here we have a block and we find a correspondence on the previous block here we have an example for disparity estimation so here for the right channel we look for a block in the left uh, video and we find a similar block here in the left video which we then use to predict it and we also have a similar block in the past right frame which we can also use to predict it so we have a combined motion and disparity estimation a joint block compensation yeah so interesting is the quantity of the use of the disparity estimation in the typical video sequence meaning how often is actually used, how often it is beneficial. So this can be seen here in this evaluation. So here in this figure we can see the number of motion compensated, joint compensated and disparity compensated frames. And this would be, the white would be motion only, the dark would be disparity only and then the gray would be both together and you can see when we go to the higher quality settings then we get more often the joint compensated yeah so q is the quality factor higher is better uh, better quality and more bitrate so here it can be seen that still just the motion estimation is used most often. The following image shows that particularly for moving object, the disparity estimation is beneficial. For instance, if a moving object frees a part of the background, which is already seen in the other view, it can be predicted using the other picture, but not the past picture. So you can see it. Here's a soccer game. So here is the subjective view of statistics of compensated block types. The highlighted blocks are disparity uh, vector predicted. It shows that moving objects such as soccer players or the ball are usually disparity vector predicted. So here those moving objects um, benefit from disparity vectors. The performance of the proposed system in the above source can be seen in the following image. So here we can see it as peak SNR comparisons. So here the dark circle 
is the proposed and joint um, prediction. Then the rectangular is MPEG4, SP is simple profile and TSP is temporal scalability profile. So you can see that here the proposed joint prediction, joint disparity and motion, um, actually has a significant improvement here. It's about 2 um, dB PSNR or when you look at the bitrate axis, you go from here, say 1000 kilobits per second for the same PN PSNR, you would need 1850 um, bitrate for um, the previous approaches. So actually a significant improvement using disparity compensation or joint uh, disparity and motion estimation. Yeah, so here it can be seen there it is the possibility of considerable bitrate savings using disparity compensation. So that's good. Another possibility to encode um, 3D content is to use a depth map, map. So instead of having two videos, we have just one video and another lower resolution video which just uh, gives us the depth of each object or each block. So this is another simple possibility of 3D video coding using depth maps. Here only one view is encoded and other views are generated using the depth map. This depth map can have a relatively low spatial resolution because the exact, exact object boundaries can be obtained from the main video view. This depth map can then be encoded with relatively low bitrate. The disadvantage is that the additional views are only approximated because there cannot be any generation of additional information. Hence, this leads to 3D views which usually don't have a high quality and as in transmitting the separate views. Like uh, if you have um, um, content behind an object which becomes visible uh, by looking with the other eye, this would be not captured in this approach. That's why it's lower quality. <clears throat> so the following image shows an example of the depth map. So here we have a stereo image, AB. We have those houses in different depth. And here you can see the resulting depth map. Right. And here's the zoom of part of it. So this is from compression and transmission of depth map maps for image-based rendering from Ravi Krishnamurti and Bing Bing Chai and Hai Tao and Sriram Sithuraman at ICIP 2001. So here the pictures A and B are the left and right view and C is the generated depth map of the two views. So here an algorithm was estimating the depth according to the disparity between the two views for each block. In the depth map, bright means near and dark means further away. This can be seen as a low resolution video in itself. As a result, for the transmission we, just, we need just one high resolution video accompanied with the low resolution depth map video, which is then used to generate an artificial 3D video view. This is also an approach treated in MPEG for standardization. Right, so basically we will need an intelligent uh, 3D generator which uh, maybe fantasizes some information which would be behind some object edge. Okay, so then there's also Blu-ray 3D. Here we usually have a standard video stream, but with the left and right views appearing in the video as the left and right half of the video image, or the lower and upper part. This means we have a reduced spatial resolution for 3D videos, either horizontally or vertically, and we have no, explicitly, um, no explicit use of the redundancies. So, between the two views. So, this is kind of wasteful, but then we also have a high data rate available at um, Blu-ray discs. Yeah, okay, so 
this should should be it for um, this part of the lecture and the lecture overall. I hope you have had fun and uh, wish you good luck for the exam. Bye bye.